Welcome to the Road Dog Project. This is Don Muskies and my canine co-host, Leon. Thanks to celebrity coaches, we're hitting the road and talking to the pros that make concerts and live events happen. If you'd like to support the channel, we'd appreciate a big thumbs up, and please enjoy the episode. On this episode in Atlanta, Georgia, we are talking to Mr. James Berry, a world-class touring audio engineer specializing in mixing in-ear monitors. Starting out in the Houston, Texas area, James has been in the audio game for over two decades. Just some of the artists that he has toured with are Bruno Mars, Lionel Richie, Adam Lambert, Three Doors Down, Stevie Wonder, Fantasia, Jennifer Hudson, Jay-Z, and for over 15 years with Miss Beyonce. He conducts numerous in-person and online masterclasses for in-ear monitor mixing and also serves as a consultant and collaborator for audio equipment manufacturers Digico, 64 Audio, Clang, and Fur Audio. He is the pride of Carthage, Texas. He is James Cowboy Barry. James. Hi, very nice to be here. Thanks, thanks for doing it. So, a um, little backstory. You and I got to be on the road together for a little bit with Fantasia. Mm -hmm. And when I was thinking of what to do on video and stuff like that, I thought about just doing something about road, road stories, and you're one of the first people I thought of because almost every day you'd stroll into the production office for one reason or other, and before you left, you were dropping little stories <laughs> left and right. And uh, I didn't realize it till like a couple weeks in. It's like, man, I get a story every day. So I hope we get to get into some of those things. That's one of the that's one of the things about touring and being with different artists. Each tour is different. Yeah. You know, each artist is different, each crew is different, so you end up picking up those, picking up those different stories yeah. as you go. Absolutely. So how long has it been since you've know, been on a bus? Um, it has been since 2019 since I've been on a bus. Yeah. When we did the last Lionel. Oh, wow. Uh, and, U.S. run. And since we talk a lot about the touring thing, is that, um, do you prefer taking the bus or flying? Um... Depends. I'm more of a flying guy. Yeah. But I don't mind the bus. Yeah. I like the Jenny sound. It does help me sleep. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and so. I'm the, I'm the king of the red eye. Okay. And early morning flights. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got a family at home and stuff like that. You got to maximize absolutely. that. Leon here is my co host. Tell me about. I know you have. Uh, livestock and things like that in your yes, in your world, but tell me, tell me about your pets. Tell me about your animals. So we have a uh, we have a pit bull mix. His name's Louie. Um, Erica, my wife, and I adopted him from Camden County Animal Shelter. Okay. Um, he was skidding bones when we first got him. He's now a ninety pound pit bull. Um, loves the kids. Um, he loves to travel. He's done a lot of travel with us. And did you have him before the pandemic? We did. We okay. had him before the pandemic. Okay. We had him before kids. Okay. Oh, wow. So, uh, so he's how old He's now? been to rehearsals. He's nine now. Okay. So he's getting up there. He's been to rehearsals in New York. He's been to rehearsals at SST, yeah. SIR, Greenhouse. <laughs> Man. Uh, very cool. So, I mean, growing up, animals always have always been in your family. Yeah. Animals yeah. always been in the family. Um, when I first, a uh, couple years back... I guess about a decade back now, I started uh, Rody's Ranch, which was a farm-to-table um, business I was doing, yeah. and uh, I just got very involved. I met my wife, and um, right. I moved up to North Jer or to Jersey and South Jersey, and um, it was just too much going back to Texas, doing the family thing. Family was way more important, so we just kind of yeah shut slowly shut down roadie's ranch but uh, uh okay cattle's always been in my family yeah. um it's kind yeah. of in my bloodline there for I, animals so. i got gotcha. you we're we're on the cusp here of coming out of this pandemic thing but what are some of the things that you did have done that you probably wouldn't have done had you not um definitely uh make the big move from jersey back back to texas yeah that probably wouldn't have happened for yeah. sure would yeah. not have happened um you know the the other thing that w we did during the pandemic was i became cowboy again okay. versus the, yeah. the cowboy label and we can talk about how i got the cowboy sure. label yeah, in yeah. industry at some point but i was literally cowboy okay um 
you know, horse, horse, cow shit every day. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Working cattle, checking the cattle. And I yeah. was working for um, a friend of mine's company, Williams Land and Cattle, last year. It wasn't okay. My stuff. But, oh, I got uh, you. I was very fortunate to, you know, find work. I know a lot of people in this pandemic wasn't able to do that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, it was very unfortunate that we basically lost everything in Jersey. We kind of, you know, just played it smart. Yeah. Trying not to, you know, we were trying to guess as everyone else was guessing the industry of so what was going to happen. I mean, I've spent yeah. the last two decades doing right. this, as, right. as a lot of people probably watching this and people who don't, you know. Well, and then like uh, I think a lot of us spent the first couple months thinking, oh, well, we're going to go back to work here in a minute or next yeah. month or whatever. What were you doing in March? What was the last thing you did or didn't get to do? Yeah, so we left early March with Lionel Richie. We went to do some private gigs in Italy, then we flew up to Israel, and then we were going over to um, Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. And I, I, probably a few people have been, it's the it's that glass building that's in the middle of the desert in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, and we we got there and it started, the, the U.S. was starting to close down. Oh, okay. And we were supposed to go from there to Vegas, and I really thought from from that point, we were going home. I was calling my wife, and yeah. I was like, I think we're coming home from Saudi Arabia. And um, we didn't. We flew to Vegas. We ended up doing a couple days rehearsal. We did the, either two shows or just the first show of the of the seven. And I was in the middle of trans, um, transferring that monitor gig over to someone else, and I was leaving to go with Carrie Underwood. Oh, okay. Um, doing a bunch of one-offs and festivals for, for uh, 2020. And I flew from Vegas... I landed in Nashville, went to sound check, we loaded in, and there was some talk that night that those show those first few shows weren't gonna happen because things were right. closing down. Yeah. So we did one day of rehearsal, we went to the hotel, we came back that morning and Graham I was like, No, we're loading out. Wow. And I just had this feeling when I was in the in the Nashville airport, like this is this is probably one of the Last. it's gonna be a while before I see an airport again. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately it's been a really long time. You go home for a minute waiting 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 uh then you find out it's not happening for a while has there been any sort of uh streaming events or live events of any sort that you've done in the in, in I, between i haven't yeah so um i basically recently took a job as one of the audio directors at passion productions here in atlanta okay and um that was the first time i touched a desk since I left Carrie Underwood. What 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 month? What, what, what? Um, we we moved to Atlanta January seventeenth of this year. Yeah. Yep. And okay. I started February first. Oh wow. So it was from March thirteenth to February first yeah. until wow. I touched the desk. I think I went and filled in for one guy at a big church in Dallas. I did. In November I went and filled in okay. for two weeks for yeah. a guy at a church in Dallas. But yeah. other than that I Yeah, I hadn't done anything. It was cowboy. That's nice. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about um, Passion City Church and the production that goes on there. Yeah, so um, we do a lot there at Passion Productions slash Passion City Church. We do a lot of live linking. We have recording studios. We yeah. have broadcast studios. Yeah. Um, we stay on the edge of everything. There's, things are always changing and moving, keeping you on your toes. So it's it's kind of like being on tour but going home every night. Yeah, yeah. So um, That's a big facility. It, it's a big facility. There's a lot. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of staff. There's a lot of contractors. There's a yeah. lot of door holders. Yeah. And um, to make it work, I think we're roughly like 67 people. Wow. Uh, that makes an event happen in general. I like yeah together for broadcasts and all. So it's it's been um, it's definitely a different pace. Sure. It's also been good to take my touring experience into this experience and kind of right. Make and the so, two worlds come together. And so, the uh, is there a, like kind of a circuit of some of the Christian acts that come through to, to perform and record? Um, or we we six step records is part of Passion. Um, so their artists we see come through a lot. Um, sometimes they'll do Sundays. Sometimes they'll do events. But other than that, it's basically our in house stuff uh, or in house artist, should I say? Um, that come through, but we do have special guests every now and then, and we we do stadium. Well, pre-pandemic, we did the New Year's gig in Mer Mercedes Stadium. Oh wow! Every year we do the amphitheater out in Alpharetta, 
We do a couple of things they call revival night that's in stadiums over the U.S. So there's still a lot of – we load in and load out every weekend just like you do on tour. Wow. I mean, as as we're doing this interview, my crew is back setting up for an event tonight. We'll completely tear everything down and go back for rehearsal and then tear that down and go back for Sunday. Oh, wow. And get ready for Mother's yeah. Day. So. That's not too far off from what you normally do. Yeah. You're coming from um, – analog very early digital days mm-hmm. that sort of thing a lot of things have progressed and stuff and do i know from my own audio days that uh monitors is sort of a thankless uh hot seat yeah. most of the time so to me i know from my own experience that you must thrive on the challenge i do yeah um i thrive on this challenge i thrive on the connection with the people on stage. Yeah. You know, early, early on, I, I kept asking tours that were coming through Houston because I was just a local stagehand, you know, shoveling uh, decks, yeah. doing lights, and whatever needed to happen. Um, I actually, um, I guess it's been 20 years now, so I can say it. I actually had a fake ID showing I was older than I was so I could work. I, I wanted to just be a stagehand. I wanted to know yeah. everything about it. I was building an old school uh, Rolodex with people's cards, like production managers that would come in, or monitor guys that would come in, or front of house. And I was just trying to just be the young guy, just trying to invest myself into being that roadie one day and see what happened. Um, so that that's kind of how I started was just being a stagehand for um, Blige Productions in Houston. They were a scaffolding slash staging company. Okay. Um, and I don't even know if they're still there, to be honest. Oh, really? I mean, it was a long time ago. And I just gained that momentum. Yeah. And early on, they were, I was big, you know, audio engineers were like, you need to pick a specialty and stick with it. You can't just keep necessarily jumping Doing all back and forth, back and forth. And I was yeah. like, monitors is my thing. I like the challenge. Yeah. It's a hot seat. And I like the relationship with the artists and the people on stage. Yeah, yeah. Which is why I guess I kind of got pushed to the, the being the the being yeah. the diva guy yeah you know high maintenance artists that you know want to be catered to a little more than other others that's, that's what, what i made my specialty that's what you do tell me about what got your attention pretty from a pretty young age you got you got interested in audio and technical things stuff like that what got your attention what got you thinking about doing this kind of thing um it was that i tried to play a lot of instruments and okay. i was not good at any of them <laughs> And I just love music, yeah. you know, so I found the avenue of how to do music without playing an instrument. Was there anybody in your family that played? No, nobody was no in music? One, no yeah. one was in music. I was the first one. Okay. You know, uh, I think everyone in my family thought I was crazy for trying this for a living, but see, it paid off. And then when you were in high school, did you... you, you when I was in high school, um, we moved to Houston when I was in the 10th grade. We moved to Houston. They had a technical theater program. Oh, okay. So I was able to, like... You know, sure. play with old analog stuff, like yeah. knowing what the gear was now, like really like old school analog stuff even for then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I also got connected volunteering at a mega church there in, in town, and they had all the latest and greatest at the time, which was kind of when it was going from analog to digital. That yeah. big swing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they had a couple Midas's out front, so yeah, I kind of got spoiled by learning on Midas and thought everything else. Oh. didn't sound good after that but <laughs> you know and then it it swung into the whole digital realm from there right. so uh and then uh going into college did you take a technical i did get a scholarship for lighting design oh. of all things wow it had nothing to do with audio but wow. kind of coming from the theater side of high school you know the community college was doing some scouting and i thought oh free education i'll go try it um, I stayed for about three months and I left so I could uh, go do audio and tour and, wow. you know, be a stagehand. Because I, I was just like, it wasn't, I love theater, but it wasn't my, Yeah. it wasn't going to be what I wanted to invest in. And I, I was turning down gigs to go to school. And at that point I was like, I'm just going to go for it. Yeah, yeah. You were working for some of these companies. I know you did some stuff with LD. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the... Uh, these the story of uh delivering microphones to the studio <laughs> so yeah so there was a company um that ld ran from that i actually was renting from while i was in, doing the high school thing i found this company called audio Van wireless that was renting us like stuff for plays and yeah. a 
acquire things. And um, the owner there, Greg Stevens, called me one day. He said, I'm just slammed, and I need to, you to make a delivery. And I was like, cool. So got in my car, and I went to make a delivery. And, and he said, it's this place called Music World. It's in the middle of downtown, right? Yeah. Houston, yeah. just drop it and you know, make sure they're good. Yeah, get this signed and come home. I was like, cool. So I went and picked up, go to what I didn't know even what Music World was at the time. They yeah. had big Destiny's Child poster on the side. I didn't even know who Destiny's Child was at the time. <laughs> I was just the guy trying to work. Yeah, and I got there and I went to drop it off, and the guy who took the delivery was Matthew Knowles. And at the time, I didn't know who Matthew Knowles was. Yeah, so I dropped it and was leaving, and he was like. Um, Hey, you're gonna stay and set it up? And I was like, Well, I was just supposed to drop it off, but sure. I guess I can. Let me check with you know, let me check with the guy that I'm dropped off. And I called Greg and Greg was like, It's up to you, negotiate yeah. your rate and do what he needs you to do. Yeah. So I did and I stayed and I never left. <laughs> um we were doing some showcases for some other artists that was on his label at the time, so we rehearsed and we're going back and forth from New York. And then Beyonce was doing her first or second solo album and she had some rehearsals in new york and kim burst which is a mutual friend of ours yeah, yeah. um was up there and called matthew and said hey i need that guy that was doing the things i, I need his help yeah yeah you know just come feeling for rehearsals yeah until ramon gets back uh, ramon was b's original monitor guy right, great right. incredible yeah, absolutely human love yeah, him yeah. He's like a brother um and i went up to new york and thought I was done because Ramon was coming back and I flew back into Houston and got the call that hey we're thinking we're going to do two monitor guys so I flew back and I then took care of the band and Ramon took care of B and just over time yeah I stepped in where Ramon was and yeah that was kind of it but if I wouldn't have delivered those wireless microphones that day yeah I would have not been in the seats and right. the positions that I've been able to be in so when you were delivering microphones where were you at technically like with your 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 chops your sound um, chops what were you i had i had i would say i had very for being let's see at that point i'd have been night i'd have been 20 i just turned 21 okay because i wasn't 21 when i flew to new york the first time because all the guys were like hey come out to the bar with us and i was like <laughs> i can't do it well i can i was like yeah i'm just gonna go back to my hotel room right um so at that point, I mean, I had been mixing monitors in in the church world, I gotcha. and you know, mainly the church world. It's it's a lot of people go, oh, it's church. No, it's a challenge for those guys who have done it. I yeah. mean, you have usually have anywhere from six to ten people up front, and then you have a full band, and yeah. it's people that don't really know what they want, so you're guessing things for them. So if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have had. I don't think I'd have had the chops to do so, what I did. So, so I did that in RF. I got you. So, that uh, session that you delivered the microphones to—that was a recording session or, or no? It was rehearsal? a rehearsal okay. for a showcase. So somehow you and ended up behind a console though. I did. Was I there, ended up was behind there? a console to do front of house of all things. Okay. Not even monitors. Okay. And I did the rehearsals with them, and then that's when they were like, you know, you did all the rehearsals, and this is a showcase. You might as well come with us. So yeah, we've all stayed at the Hudson. Unbelievable. There with the little bitty hotel rooms. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's a that's definitely a story of opportunity, and you never know what happens yeah. when you. It was, it was the right place at the right time. And absolutely, and and still with that act, yeah. unbelievable. I and mean, I think that's a I think that's our industry. A lot of our industry, we were all in the right place at the right time. Some's knowledge, some being in the right yeah. place. Some's just relationship and knowing someone, and that's what's been hard through the pandemic. Because I I found like I was like you know what I'll just go get a I'll just go get a job at Lowe's being a forklift driver. I drive forklifts every day. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, I wasn't qualified to drive, <laughs> well, drive a forklift, you know, and I, that's a whole. It's weird because we're a big word of mouth industry. Well, exactly. I was going to say there's very few jobs that we get by resume. It's usually word of mouth mm -hmm. or or by interview yep. for a job. We hardly do that. And then a whole separate subject in the pandemic, trying to go get a regular job. Well, half of those guys, forklift drivers and warehouse people and things like that, got laid off from those jobs. Yep. And here we come with the resume that barely supports those sort of jobs. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get into all that. <laughs> uh, so coming up, Houston area, local scene, was there, uh, of course you were working in a lot of it, but mm -hmm. was there any, like when you were younger, was there any events or concerts or anything like that that sort of like, you know, was that 
really got your attention. Oh, uh, yeah. There was one. I, I still tell people. I was just having this story the other day. And somebody asked me what one of the best live shows I've ever seen. Yeah. And it was during that time. Yeah, it was yeah. Green Day. I saw them at Toyota Center in Houston. Okay. And uh, I was like, this is it. Yeah, this is what you want. This to... is what I want to be a part of. Like, yeah. And we saw a lot of stuff come through the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Pavilion. I was one of the yeah. guys that was always out there patching stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the big music festivals downtown. But that was the one that's always stuck out from. Very cool. I think it was the uh, I think it was the American Idiot tour. Oh wow! That he did. Coming up from there, I would imagine that when uh, Beyonce took breaks and things like that, then you would venture off and take. Word of mouth. Yeah. Get picked take, up on some other yeah, things. Pick up other stuff. It was right during the show Co Claire buy out, so it was good to have their support too, because they were able to help me find other gigs when um MO Procise was here, he Yeah. You know, he always had my back. I mean that's that's how I ended up getting the Bruno gig was through ML. Okay. You know, and Bruno gig came up between a break, one of these breaks, and ML called and was like, Hey, I need you to go do this and then I looked at him and said, Em, are you sure? I don't normally do male artists. He's like, I trust me on this one. Go, yeah. go do this. And it was a, it was great. I loved, loved the band. Bruno. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a great gig. But that one came from word of mouth from ML. Yeah. And you still still work with him occasionally? Um, I haven't. I mean, yeah. I keep in touch with him. Yeah. Ramon, that was with Beyonce, is now with Bruno. Oh, okay. With Bruno. Okay. Um... Was there any other like significant venues and things like that that you worked at or went to in that time period when you were kind of coming up and trying to figure um, in the Houston? It was mostly. I always I I always tried to like it. The Houston rodeo was a thing too. Oh yeah. So you know oh, yeah. LD. everyone's everyone's done the rodeo. Everyone you know that's yeah. worked for LD or been a stagehand has put a shovel in that dirt. Yeah. Um, that was always the thing. I was like, I want to do stadiums every, every day. Yeah. You know, that's that's my goal. Yeah. And then I started doing it, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do stadiums every day. Yeah, yeah. But but that was like the drive. So I guess yeah. it was kind of the dome slash Reliant. I think it's still called. Yeah, I I've gotten to work with Robbie Osmus and know about the early days of all the different designs that they put in the Astrodome and all those sort of things. Yeah. When there's not a pandemic, you have probably have plenty of work, mm-hmm. but um, there's probably uh, you can be selective. So, anything significant that you've turned down? Um, Might have been for because of a schedule, or be just because you weren't interested. That I would say there's a few yeah. out there, and I would say if I've turned something big or significant, it's just because I didn't think it was a fit for me. Yeah. I didn't think myself and the artist would get along, and being in that hot seat, being that yeah. artist's yeah person person I, I have to have a connection with that artist if i don't it just doesn't work and if i'm not out there feeling like i'm bettering the show yeah then i'd prefer just not to be there and go find the show that betters yeah that i can help better and be a part of so, so so talk about that a little bit so if you're going into new gig sort of an approach to how you're going to start start your thing how you're going to build your thing uh mixes and, and figuring out what everybody needs whether it's directly just for the artist or if it's a whole band yeah. and things like that so what do you what do you try to do when you come in um it depends i guess there's two approaches i take if it's i'm coming in and starting in like a rehearsal process you know i like to spend some time with the band get to like know the band get, like even if it's just, just talking talking shit with them just yeah yeah in the rehearsal room drinking yeah you know coffee or whatever when they first show up like I I like to try to figure out them person like their personality and stuff to know how to communicate with them because the biggest part of being a manager is the communication between you and the band yeah yeah. or you and the artist absolutely um so that's my thing if I'm coming in hot like if it's a situation to where an artist has been going through the rotation I kind of come in real hot too with just like this is how we're going to do this yeah. and I need you to trust me Yeah. and if it works it works if it doesn't then it doesn't yeah. but if it works we're going to be a good team Yeah. and, and that's I feel like that's the, the way I came into Fantasia Absolutely. when I met you I mean well, exactly. we flipped that whole rig that night oh yeah we flipped consoles we flipped that we flipped yeah. the you know mine and Gordon's preference and we just went in hot and that's basically the conversation I had with her when you took me to the dressing room like yeah we're going to be a team. we got to get this done. So that's the two approaches I take, right. depending on the situation. Well, you have a lot of times when an artist will have this 
revolving door of monitor guys. So obviously something in that consistency is not, you got it. sometimes you have to take a left turn and yeah. just turn it over. And I guess I started that when um, you had mentioned Weezer earlier. Yeah. Um, I was with Weezer for a very, very short period of time. Yeah. But I'd left Weezer and the guy that w was, Weezer's guy was out with Adam Lambert. And let's go back to the word of mouth. We basically just flipped. Oh, okay. And he told me, he goes, you, it was, um, I don't know if he, pork chop. He goes by pork chop. We flipped and he was like, you don't want to come out here. And I'm like, I want to try it. Yeah. Like, it was one of those. Yeah, you're thriving on it. What do I have to lose? Yeah. And I literally got there and I did the same thing. I was like, dude, we can either be a team or not. We yeah. ain't going to give up, so let's be a team. It's awesome. It took us a couple of weeks and I think it was a hundred and yeah. something shows later. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're going after it. You're going after the challenge. There's an art to, especially with in-ears, um, getting artists com comfortable with in-ears. And I know you, you have an elaborate audience mic situation, things like <laughs> that. And um, you also have to uh, deal with artists that want to use side fills and monitors, mm -hmm. or you have, or these artists that want to use one ear, things right. like that too. So, what's your conversation go like for that kind of stuff? Um, I guess it goes kind of back to the trust thing. I, I kind of feel like, I try to feel like what the artist is thinking, yeah. what I'd like to do and how to get them. I, I always tell anyone I'm mixing for, it's your yacht, I'm just your captain. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll drive it however you want me to drive yeah. it, but I'm not going to let you hit an iceberg either. Yeah. Um, but like, I normally like to do that big a big audience package so that I can the reason I do that is because I want the artist to feel like they don't have the ears in and when that crowd roars they yeah. feel that roar it's not just a plug that yeah you know some artists like that some artists like to be plugged you yeah. know but I always try to approach it that way when it comes to the whole one ear thing I try to get completely away from that for several reasons more hearing loss than anything else sure. yeah. um, and it's just really difficult and I think you can have a better show either going one way or the other but mixing the two is yeah. Well, I I, I find that a lot of artists they they want to they want to do the one ear thing because they don't want to lose the perception of the right. feel of the room. But and that's kind of where yeah. I try to bring the audience package in. I've I've been very fortunate. I haven't always won this battle with artists, yeah. but um, I think we got to the point in Fantasia where oh, the yeah. side fields weren't even up anymore. Yeah, because we were having problems with sight lines and things yeah. like that in arenas, and and it was wonderful to be able to pull those away. Yeah, so I think that was just gaining her trust and showing yeah. her that we could make it sound big, we could make it, you know. What was sort of like the first things you were doing with in-ears? I mean, I would imagine in the beginning it was just wedges and things like that before you started getting right. into ears. It was it was um, the old Sure Generics, and yeah. then it turned into the Future Sonics, which everyone had Future Sonics, yeah. and then yeah. I went from there to Sensophonics, and then yeah. I went from there to JH, yeah. and I went from JH to now 64. Okay. And I, I've recently, in the last year or so, like pre-pandemic, during pandemic, you know, I've gotten into like the actual art behind building ears and the, the way ears. they sound. And I got to be a very big key player in the A 18S that 64 has. I was part of that tuning. Oh, very cool. Thought. So it was cool to go through that process, starting, you know, yeah. from wedges all the way to knowing that it's yeah. just not a headphone, like how they tune it, why it does this way. And yeah what reacts a certain way. They so. have uh, gotten very elaborate exactly. from the Future Sonic days. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also with that, you've also kind of hung on to some analog gear. You do I some have. rack stuff it, rather I than do. plugins. Yeah, I'm one of the few guys out there that likes to mix on digital console but keep my analog love. Um, yeah. I've been bit by plugins, all of them. We all yeah. have at some point. Yeah. And I just prefer the way it sounds personally and and that kind of came about during the bruno days because he kind of wanted that raw analog sound but i didn't necessarily want to mix analog with you know a yeah. band that big and yeah. all that so that's why i kind of started introducing uh, playing with a lot of outboard gear now it's turned into whole festivity but um it gets the job done absolutely tell me about being hired and fired within a day or a week uh, the I think there was a couple things you told me about sometimes when you left the venue, came back to venue, came yeah, left an artist, came uh, back to an artist. That was during the Ad that was during the Adam Lambert days. Okay. Sometimes we'd have good days and sometimes have have bad days. Yeah. And I guess one of the <clears throat> one of the one of those stories was we were in I think it was Tokyo. We were somewhere in Japan. It was either Tokyo or Osaka, and I just had enough. We had a rough night. There was yeah. 
there was ears thrown, there was tequila bottles thrown, <laughs> there was like um, Jeff Worth was my tech at the time. I told him just I'll look down and mix. You just make sure there's nothing going to hit us. <laughs> you know, it was one of those nights, and I was just like, I'm out. Yeah, yeah. So I went to production. I'm like, I'm going to the airport. I don't know what you guys are doing, but I'm out. I was in the airport, got the call. What will it take? What will it take? I was like, I'm done. So yeah. I'd quit. I went back the next night after we had some conversations. <laughs> I went back for the next show, and then I got fired. I was at the airport, got rehired, and went back finished that and i was like there's no way we're going to hawaii well went to hawaii and after hawaii i was like we we did over 100 shows like oh it's it's yeah. no longer healthy for either one of us yeah but yeah that was a quit hired back fired hired back all within like a three-day period man talk about when you're mixing front of house mm-hmm. do you um do you think about doing any front of house um, every now and then funny story is um Two or three weekends ago, we were short a front of house guy here at yeah. Passion, and uh, I stepped out front. Yeah. And uh, kind of felt it felt good. Yeah. It felt a little weird. Yeah. I, I was. Uh, yeah. I was having fun. That's so. very cool. Yeah. Very cool. You don't know where the gig is. You don't know who it is, what it is. Three things you got to have. Three things you got to have in your toolbox or in your bag or in your case or something to hit the. Um. My phone to call my family, number one. Yeah. Um, I'd have to have a digico. Okay. Of some sort. Okay. And um, a good tech. Preferably my guy that's rolled with me a long time now. Okay. Those are the three things I'd need. Okay. And then you I can feel like I could get myself out of anything with those get three anything things. Out. Okay. Who is an act or an artist that's no longer around that you would have liked to work with? Whether they passed away, whether they broke up, those sort of things. I'd probably say Michael Jackson. I think I'd like to take a stab at that. Oh, one. Wow. I feel like it would have been a good challenge. Yeah. Um, uh, I, think, I think most of us had the Prince challenge before. So. <laughs> um, Is there? Uh, have you heard war stories about uh, Michael Jackson? I haven't. I mm-hmm. haven't really heard yeah. a bunch of war stories necessarily, but I still think it w- it would have been a challenge. Absolutely. He's the same perfectionist a lot of Absolutely. artists I've worked with. You know, musically. Yeah. When you're in this business, it's rare that we sit in the audience or or uh, buy a ticket. Mm-hmm. Is there somebody that you would buy a ticket to go see? Mm. <laughs> That's a tough one. I feel like we all have enough connections. We should. <laughs> so but, we <laughs> well, well, but yes, well, I, I am into supporting the artists also. Well, but so even if you had the connection, somebody that yeah. you'd sit out front to watch. I think Fleetwood. Oh, okay. Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Which version? <laughs> the current. Oh, really? The current, yeah. yeah. Uh, my wife actually went and saw the current um, oh, okay. lineup, and she said it was the best show she's ever seen in her life. Um, really? I was out wow. Working and made that call. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, I'd say Fleetwood. Okay. Who is an actor that would play you in your life movie? Oof. <laughs> I don't know a lot of actors, to be honest. Maybe Matthew McConaughey. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. If I had to think of one off the top of my head. Okay. What's the last song that you had in your player? Whether it was in the car, was it in your headphones? On your um, <laughs> so here's a funny story. I was actually fixing the PA in the main building of ours the other day. I tuned to a song called Beer with Jesus. Okay. So that was the last thing I played. Anyone that's toured with me has heard it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Beer with Jesus. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very cool. If you had to, analog console that you... That XL4. You, oh, yeah? Off All bat. day long. Doesn't... Yeah, okay. <laughs> great. So let's talk about how people can uh, keep track of you, what you're doing, and things like that. Yeah, I think um, I think the best route would be probably my Instagram, go for Barry Productions. Okay. I, I started with a group of friends, uh, uh, Road Crew Live which is a training. We were trying to train people like up in audio and okay. broadcast and yeah. monitors and front of house. And it was kind of a unique event. So I, I do a lot of updates there as far as like my techniques and stuff. Cool. Is more landed on those pages. I got you. Well, very cool. Anything else that we need to uh, cover that you're doing or want people to know about? No, I think 
I think the main thing is as as a community of roadies right now, yeah, we yeah. just have to look out for each other. Absolutely. And as as it turns turns around and we start doing more shows, I think we just need to still have each other's back and not be cutthroat. Yeah. I think that this is either going to go really well when this restarts or it's going to go really bad. And uh, I just we just have to stay strong as a community like we've been. I mean, we move around the world and we build cities. And we give people the ability to forget about all their worries and cares for that two yeah. hours. Yeah. You know, and I think as we start back up, we have to think of why we did it originally. Um, yeah. So I think we just have to stay strong as a community, as we always have. Of, of roadies, road Ag- dogs. Agreed. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Very, very cool. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about that I like to talk about is just road food. What do you got to have on the road? Oh, man. Um, coffee. Definitely coffee. Okay. I, I travel, those who have toured with me, we yeah. do travel with Cafe Modern World when you're with me. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, coffee is the most important thing. I got you. Is there, is there something from uh, the home area that you, you don't get around in other, in other parts of the country that you got to have? Um, Are you a Whataburger a good, guy? I'm not a word. I'm not a word burger guy. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say down home sausage. <laughs> okay. They're a sausage company out of a little bitty town called Stonewall, Louisiana, and you can't find it anywhere else. You can get them to ship it to you, but wow, that's that's uh, that's the thing. I, I love to grill out, love to barbecue. Okay. So I like to do them outside the bus too. We used to travel with one in the bay, and then okay, you know, we do some grill outs for after show food every now and then. And so days off. And do you cook? Sometimes, you go? yes, oh, I do. Cool. It is a hobby of mine. Very cool. All right. Well, I think we're nearing our stop, and uh, I just want to say thanks for inviting me. Oh, uh, it's been man. incredible. It, it feels good to be back on a bus. Well, I said I was a flying guy, but it feels good to ride on a bus. Well, that's the whole thing. Is that when I was trying to figure out what to do. And I apologize for the audio things. Like every time I have an audio guy, I have I have audio issues, and the road is bumpy, and and I'm short on time. So we'll get this, you know, sorted out. But thank you for doing this because uh, this is part of the helping each other out. Yeah. And for me, this has been cathartic to just pretend we're going to a gig, get on a yeah. bus, yeah, get exactly. on a bus, and act like we're doing something. So thank you so much for doing it. He is uh, touring. Uh, master in-ear monitor mixing engineer James Cowboy Berry thanks so much thank you thanks so much for watching if you enjoyed the episode please give us a thumbs up and we welcome your comments check out more of the Road Dog Project here on YouTube follow on Facebook TikTok Instagram and Twitter come on Leon